Welcome to another episode of Before You Kill Yourself with your host, Leo Flowers. I am Leo Flowers. Today's guest, <laughs> look at his smile. He, he's smiling, ladies and gentlemen. That's why I do it like that. I am Leo Flowers. Um, Zach Brittle, who we've had on here before, renowned uh, marriage and family therapist. Where are you at uh, again? Seattle? I'm in Seattle, Washington. Yeah. Seattle, Washington. You know what? I was just up there, Zach. We're, we're gonna, I'm going to be back up there in um, April, May, June, September. Why? In the next few months. Uh, doing con- <laughs> I'm laughing because right before the episode, I told him um, I was happy, and he goes, "Why?" It, 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 so I'm just laughing that um, that's his word. Um, to do stand up, yeah, you should definitely know. You should definitely let me know. We, yeah, um, I'm gonna let you know. Uh, yeah, I'll get the date, and we'll 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 get we'll get the squad out there. It'd be great to see you, buddy. Yeah. Uh, it could, Michelle, my girlfriend, her uh, family is up there. They live up there. Right on. Um, but we have Zach Brittle on because. I've been watching, reading, listening to uh, all the things uh, regarding Will Smith and Chris Rock at the Oscars, and I'm not here to debate whether actions were right or wrong. That's that's not what this episode's about. This is a suicide prevention podcast, so you go, what does the Will Smith, Chris Rock thing have to do with suicide prevention? So many things, because what I really want to dig deep into are, one, the emotions, because so many people are walking around with anger, resentment, and frustrations, and we haven't dealt with them whether they are from recent events, whether they're from our childhood. Um, and when we don't sit down with them, when we haven't figured out how to manage them, how to, how to dissipate them, how to express them in a healthy way, they can, ex- they can show up at you know a time like they did for Will at the Oscars. Um, and at that moment, it's... it's not to say it's too late, but we can't we can't pretend that our internal experiences are not that, and that we can just handle it, and that I'll just push that down and move on to the next day. Sure, you can do that once or twice. Uh, you, you could maybe even do that for weeks or years, but at some point, there potentially is going to be an eruption, as we witnessed. So I, I want to start there because the the way I, I – did you watch it, Zach? Um, I've only watched it uh, on the replays and kind of seen, seen it all on Twitter. I did not watch it live, no. Okay, so I want to talk about this from an emotional <coughs> perspective and yeah. then tell me how you feel about this. Okay. When Chris Rock said – what he said about when he told a joke about Will Smith's wife, mm-hmm. we see Will Smith laughing. That's right. So to me, that denotes a kind of people pleasing. This is a joke. I'm going to go along with this. Ha ha ha. Right. Then Will looks at his wife and sees she's not laughing. So I'm imagining at that moment, Will is now feeling shame over, uh oh. Sure. I wasn't just laughing at the joke. Now probably the Jada, it looks like I'm laughing at her. So now with that shame comes some guilt of like, I have just done something wrong. And then there's anger at like, oh, you know, this, you know, the joke made me feel this way and has me laughing at my wife. And my wife has to go through this again because Chris Rock had told us, made a joke about Jada at a previous Oscar mm-hmm. um, event. And so we had this world of, of emotions of going from people pleasing of just, I'm just going to go along with this thing that's a little uncomfortable, but ha ha, to shame, to guilt, and then anger. It, would you 
uh, agree that maybe that was progression of emotions or am I missing one or, or do we add one? I don't know. I mean, there's a couple of words that pop into my mind about that moment. One was probably embarrassment, you know, and, and then a little bit, frankly, of emasculation. I mean, he, he turns to his wife and she says, what are you, what are you doing? You little boy laughing at this unfunny joke about me that you're supposed to, you know, like he immediately goes into like, I think, I think shame is the right probably label for that, but it's almost like he had to go figure out how to reclaim his manhood. And I don't think it was Chris Rock that emasculated him. I think it was Jada, which is certainly her prerogative, but that's, you know, yeah. I'm not criticizing her for doing for, for that. Right. She had the real feeling that she really had. She wasn't like she was punishing him as much as that was the, that feels to me closer to what the transaction was between the two of them silently. So, okay. So talk to me about that look and emasculation because uh, that's something I had not even uh, has not even occurred to me, but I'm very familiar with that feeling of feeling emasculated and how reactive that can make me feel. So Mm -hmm. please share more about that. Well, there's a very, uh, I think you're about the same age as me back in the seventies, there was a really hot, kind of um, psychological theory that was emerging. It was called transactional analysis. Remember that TA for tots or TA for kids? It's all about um, I'm okay. You're okay. Oh yes. Right, right, right. So part of the transactional analysis though, includes this idea that everybody has inside of them, a parent an adult and a child. Um, We all have those personas that are operating in different ways for different reasons. Uh, and that includes children. I mean, like toddlers have a parent in them sometimes. You know, we we all seen bossy toddlers who are out there trying to figure it out. And I know more than a few, you know, 45 year old men and <laughs> who are still children in their own ways. But you know, those things are always in play. They're kind of moving back and forth between each other. Ideal situation in marriage, of course, is that there's an adult and an adult talking to each other, two adults. In this case, it seems like you know, Will Smith was enjoying his moment, right? This was his night. This was his, this was his night, you know? And um, I don't know if it was inevitable that he was going to win. I didn't know if it was, he was a front runner or not, but he's just enjoying his moment. And he looks over and the, I don't see the look that she gave him, but she definitely had a kind of a parental vibe, like the parent in her was coming out. And, and so that forces him to become a child, right? He has to go to child at that point because he's being parented. Um, and so what is his response? He's got to figure out how to un, unfeel that, Right. And so for a guy like Will Smith, who is an achiever and who's been successful in every corner of every space that he's ever entered, um, he's got to get big. He's got to get bigger than just kind of there. He he doesn't really have many choices. I mean, I think he has a lot of choices, but this is a guy who's used to performing. And so he went into a big performance, which I think is ultimately what it was. So talk to me, Zach, you said he had choices and And it just occurred to me today, you know, watching it is if I'm hurt, if I feel attacked, one of my options that, you know, one of my tools is to go for a walk, walk it off, Mm -hmm. get some fresh air. But Will Smith is sitting front row and has not received his trophy yet. And they're filming. So, yes, he could get up and go for a walk, walk it off or but what are the. In situations where people don't have the opportunity to just get up and walk out of the boardroom or out of the office or leave their home, or, you know, even if you're uh, in in a a room or a jail cell and, you know, words are going back and forth and uh, what are his mental or emotional choices at that moment? Well, you know, again, to me, I didn't watch it live and I've only kind of read a lot of things for me, ultimately everybody's opinion about what happened in that moment probably says more about them than it does about Will Smith or Jada Pinkett Smith or Chris Rock. Like that's just the natural thing for me. I have a pretty, pretty strong contempt for men who abuse power. So all I know is here's Will Smith. He, he got offended. And at some point he decided it was a good idea to stand up and slowly walk over to another man on television 
and physically slap him. Um, now, what other choices did he have? Like all of them, you know, I mean, the, the reality is Chris Rock didn't attack his wife. Um, Chris Rock made a joke that was unfunny and offensive, but it wasn't like he was threatening her. There wasn't. It, so that's where your mama bear thing kind of falls apart a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Cause it's not like there was a predator out. I mean, if I, if I'm in my best brain in that moment and I'm feeling the same exact thing um, next to my wife, who is clearly hurt and offended, if I'm in my best brain <laughs> and I don't know if I am, right? Like, cause I'm on TV and it's loaded and it's my night. <laughs> um, but I think the choice that, that I would have hoped for him would be to have turned directly into Jada's space and say, I got you. I got this. Like I'll, I'll talk to him after the show. Um, to, to, cause for me, my lens is as a couples therapist, right? Like I care a lot less about whether or not Chris Rock gets an apology from Will Smith and I do about sort of what's going on between the two of them. And uh, I would have loved for him to have turned right into her and go, you know what? I, that's, that's not cool. I probably shouldn't have done that, but let me, I'll take care of it in a minute. I got you, babe. You know? Um, and then it's a non-event. I mean, the problem with, well, <laughs> there's this whole other dynamic too, about whether or not he was protecting her and whether or not he was protecting women, which is fine. Maybe he was. Um, but what he, also did was take oh he, like he, there's sort of this speculation that maybe he took jada pinkett smith's voice away right um but he also took jane campion's voice away and jessica chastain's voice away and and amy schumer's voice away like we're not talking about any of those women who you know two days later you and i are having a conversation about will smith and that's where i'm like sometimes the choice that you have is to become smaller on purpose in order to elevate those that you're really trying to protect. And he didn't do it. And maybe he just got overwhelmed. I mean, I don't know if you remember back in the world cup a handful of years ago, some guy was insulting Zinedine Zidane's mother. And he, uh, in the middle of a soccer game, just put his head down and just plowed this guy right in, got a red card, the biggest stage in the world for a soccer player, just like Will Smith, right? Sometimes we just get overwhelmed. We get flooded by our stuff. And so you have to make space for, that he's human, but man, he shifted the conversation, I think away from probably a really well-deserved win. I did not see that movie, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, just the other stories that came out of that night that are no longer really stories. Wow. So there is a few things that I really want to peel back the layers on. Uh, one, let's go back to the idea of what Chris Rock said wasn't threatening. And this is beautiful because so many times when we feel flooded and we react to a situation, um, we feel like we're being threatened when in fact sure. we're hurt. And when we're <clears throat> flooded, it's hard for us to make that distinction. Mm -hmm. And so we do have people who will end their lives because they think that uh, a, a situation is is the end of the world, and every and and we you know we can over catastrophize a situation or see something as a bigger threat than what it really is. And so uh, you know, I remember when I played high school football, my coach would you know if I got hurt or you know hit and I'm laying there, and the coach would be like, "Are you hurt or are you injured?" Mm -hmm. You know, hurt just meant that uh, you know you got the wind knocked out of you, but you'll be okay. But injured means we got to pull you off the field and initially on that initial impact you think you're injured mm -hmm. and then as a little time goes by you go oh, okay i'm just hurt i'll be fine but when you get that wind knocked out of you you think lights out you know my life is over um yeah can you wow. talk to us about that distinction between yeah i mean i when i talk to couples about it or people i i don't make that exact distinction it's more the difference between hurt and harm okay Hurt and harm are different things, right? Like hurt is pain that you're feeling. Harm comes with this measure of intent. And did Chris Rock intend to make a joke? Sure. Did he intend to harm? Maybe. Um, but she was, I think, you know, the other distinction that we have to understand is that feeling attacked isn't the same as being attacked. Um, and so 
we have to put a pause between the the feeling of being attacked or the feeling of being hurt and make some decisions about the degree of harm or the degree of you know intent that's there and um you know again i, I think i don't want to sort of apparently there was some noise about that joke wasn't in the dry run and it wasn't on the teleprompter and chris rock kind of took that into his own hands and maybe he really was trying to noodle these guys that he has some sort of rivalry with but again he wasn't raising it to the level of attack right everybody in the room understood that that was the nature of the game for them for a moment until it shifted between will and jada right and so for me it comes down to exactly what you're describing when we feel hurt the first thing we have to do is pause long enough to discern whether or not that's an actual threat or a perceived threat um and I think Will Smith had a choice to honor the hurt without having to respond to a threat that really wasn't, really wasn't a threat. Right. I mean, it was just a dumb, dumb, mean joke, you know, I, hurt is, I, I had a, one of my old roommates says something <clears throat> that uh, really hurt. And I had, it was, I have to be, I'm 46, I just turned 46. And Zach, it was the first time in my 46 years, I was 40, 44 at the time, actually, that I had ever admitted when someone said something that hurt me. Hmm. And Zach, when I tell you, it was the hardest thing that I ever did. It was, it had to be the hard, one of the hardest things I ever said. Not did, but, but said. I, it took so much energy. I was like, I mean, I'm like, I remember pacing in my room back and forth being like, that really hurt. Just go out there and just say that what she said hurt you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, just do it. And I was like, come on, you can do it. Like, I'm, I'm like literally pepping myself. Why is it so hard? Is it, all right, is it harder for men to admit that they're hurt? Or is it just harder for people in general to admit that they've been hurt and what's underlying that? Why can't we just, because I, I can't remember the last time I heard somebody say, that really hurt. We usually just lash out with anger or we shut down and withdraw. Yeah, what's interesting to me about that is that you you didn't have a hard time admitting that you were hurt because you you knew it, right? You admitted you were hurt. You had a hard time admitting it out loud, mm. right? You were able to say, ow, and check in with your body and pace a little bit and go, ah, ow. Um, the harder part was inviting somebody else to be a part of that with you, um, particularly somebody that you didn't know what kind of response you were going to get, you know? Um, and ideally you're building trust enough inside of a relationship that you can sort of, I mean, that's what I say to Rebecca all the time. She says something, I go, ow, because I'm really careful to make sure that I don't so say you hurt me <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I just go ouch. Or sometimes I'll go, you want to try again? Because I don't think the people that we spend most of our life with are trying to harm us. Um, but it's information, right? It's just information that your body's giving you. And, and <clears throat> so I don't know the situation you're describing exactly or how safe it was, but I think part of it, I mean, it's vulnerable to let somebody else know that they've, that they've hurt you. Um, because I don't think we have a lot of examples of watching people do that where the end is more intimacy, right? Like the, 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 the ideal situation. I always ask people, I was like, what's the, what's the ideal outcome of conflict? And it's makeup sex if for a couple, like the ideal outcome for any argument is makeup sex. It's, it's, it's conflict that leads to deeper understanding and more intimacy. And I just don't think we have a lot of examples of that. And that's why that thing was so disappointing because, you know, we're having a whole conversation about the appropriateness or not of Will Smith's emotional outburst or Chris Rock's joke or Jada's role in it, but we're not talking about what it means to actually just treat each other with fundamental regard. Well, fundamental regard. Say, say more about that because I, um, I don't quite understand. Just like, Hey man, you're a human. I'm a human. Or even like for him to go to, uh, I, I don't know, dude, that setting is so weird. We have all these famous people who are doing a made up, they're in a made up, room with a made up contest about made up things that are literally all made up. So it's hard to understand what's real and what's not real, but you know, the, the ideal outcome of that 
um, that joke maybe is a, is a thoughtful conversation about alopecia or a thoughtful conversation about, um, you know, the role of comedy in, you know, uh, marriage, or I don't know what it is, but like, we're not having any of that. We're not talking about just what does it mean to be in a world that we're trying to make sense of things with respect and regard for one another. And I don't know how comedy folds into that because comedy is supposed to make us consider the absurd and it's supposed to make us go, Oh, I did not see that coming. Like that's the purpose of comedy. So it's really hard to understand a little bit of, <clears throat> you know, I, I mean, I imagine, uh, Imagine how much different that whole thing would have been if they're just at a dinner party around the table, Chris Rock's there with his wife and they're all just kind of sitting there. He goes, yeah, hey, I can't wait to see G.I. Jane too. Jada Pinkin in it. You know, the room gets really awkward and quiet and weird. Um, but then maybe the conversation opens up. So it's, it's hard to understand exactly what, what could have gone differently. But I think when we concentrate on just treating each other with a, like a sense of, your humanity matters to me, <laughs> then we can change, we can change the nature of it all. Well, yeah. Well, so much talk is about, you know, be uh, as a man, being able to protect your woman. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm reading this book um, called uh, more than words. It's okay. a, it's a new book, LMFT. And he was saying that our brains are not wired for love. It's, it's more wired for survival and that what we're really seeking in a relationship is safety and security. So I, I guess my question is this idea that the, the man's job is to protect the woman. Is that, should we reframe that to say that uh, the role of the relationship is to feel safe and secure or the, the man's job is to help her feel safe and secure? Uh, maybe. I mean, I think there's lots of nuances to it. I mean, I, I've been messing around with this question of the man's job is to protect the woman. I think, I think most of that dialogue has been around the man is the protector, but of, you know, of what, of, again, of her safety, that certainly wasn't the case. You know, I think, and I think that night, Will Smith was protecting his own masculinity more than anything. Um, so part of it is kind of understanding what is the role that he had there? How could he have really protected her? You know, what was really at risk? You know, if it was her sense of self, then he looks into her eyes and he says, I got you right. I'm, I can protect that for you. Um, but, it, um, but yeah, I, I think women have had to kind of wrestle with this question quite a bit about what's their role in being protected. You know, I, I often talk about how I don't think the man's job is to, um, <clears throat> I think, I think uh, the, the way I would put this is often the man thinks that it's the man's job to get, get out in front of the woman, but it's more like get, have her back, right? To protect her is to have her back and to say, I got you, like you, you can handle this yourself. And that's certainly the way I feel about my wife and my two teenage daughters. I don't want to get out in front of them and, and somehow decide what they need as a protector, I want to take my cues from them and see how I can support whatever it is that they're chasing. I love that to, to be supportive. It's almost like when you see those images of a wolf pack, the, the, the alpha wolf, the right? main yeah. wolf is not up front. He's in the back. Yeah. And, and he's making sure that, you know, we're going at the pace of, uh, of, the, of the tribe versus him dictating how fast, uh, you know, we can go or where we're going to go. Um, you know, the other thing that comes up, cause you talked about your wife and you talked about your daughter, what conversation, um, I don't want to use the word should, but what would be an, an effective or conversation to have going forward for Will Smith with his children and for Chris Rock and his daughters, they, they both have, Will has boys and girls. Um, and, but Chris has two daughters. I don't know if that's too vague of a question, but when I, when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about what do you as a parent say to your children about what's happened? And is that different than what you say to the world? 
Well, I can tell you what I think as an actual parent of my actual kid who is in the industry. She's an actress. And so she's kind of got some, some connection to some of this energy. To, the, the first part is it's really hard to understand in terms of what we, where we're sitting, what, what's real and what's not. Right. Jimmy Kimmel was talking about how when he first saw it on TV, he thought, wow, Will Smith did a great job with that slap. Will and Chris really choreographed that really well, thinking it was a joke. And it was only later that they found out it was real. So if I'm Will or Chris and I go home and I'm like, hey, we need to have two different conversations here. We need to have the one conversation about what happened on the television and what we're going to do with our publicist and our you know, management team to sort of correct and direct the traffic here. That's, that's just business, right? The other part though is, you know, I don't know enough about what it's like to be in those side of those homes. Most of the people that I've met now in the business, they're just regular people. I mean, just regular people who put on these costumes called celebrity every now and again, and they go march around and, you know, get their paychecks and they go home and they try to figure it out. Um, and I think you need to, I think the part that's missing from Hollywood or all the part that's made up is that just the, what is really, really there? Who, what is really here? And only Will and Jada know what's really there. Only Will knows what's really there with his kids. Like if he goes and offers them another apology for some embarrassing thing he did, are they going to roll their eyes? Or are they going to go, okay, dad, how are we going to lean into this? Like, how are we going to make this happen? And that's the conversation I had to have with my kid was the both versions, right? I had to have the one about what did I think about what happened on the stage and then I had the other one, which was what really happened? Oh, well, Jane Campion directed this movie in New Zealand that was based on a Western and created a whole story in a universe that didn't exist. And one was a second female director to win in a consecutive years. And then Jessica Chastain, who's been hustling, 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 she did this thing. And how about that queer lady that won the uh, Ariana DuBose who won from West Side Story? Like, there's the, like I had to, I wanted to shift the conversation pretty readily, pretty rapidly toward what what was the new ground being broken? Um, because that's what Will has to do now is break new ground and to kind of show people that not only is he really good at writing a statement and then releasing it on Instagram, but he's willing to kind of put his money where his mouth is. And I think that calls for some kind of energy around changing the conversation and pointing it in a different direction. I love that. Yeah. Cause what, what, you know, I read his apology and, and uh, it was me, lovely. It was great. Like a I, great I, I apology. Yeah. Apology. Yeah. So can you break down what makes a great apology? Cause we've seen some horrendous apologies, uh, made public, you know, like, Oh, that was not an apology. Yeah. Uh, so what, what are the components of an effective apology? Well, I think the number one is acknowledgement that the thing that needs to be apologized for it actually happened. Like the thing that you, the thing that, we all know happened. It happened. Um, it's not a, it's not an accident. It's not a got, it's not a got away from me. It's a, I made a choice and that choice was inexcusable and indefensible. I think were the two words that he uses. Like it's like, it's really important to acknowledge the people's reality, uh, particularly with your loved ones, right? Your loved one says, ouch, that hurt me. Um, it's not, it's no good to hear. I didn't mean to, oh, I didn't mean to hurt you or you shouldn't be hurt. Cause that was not a big deal. It's no, you're right. I did say that thing. Leo, I did say that thing that hurt you. And that is, I want to validate that that is a real thing that really happened to you. That'd be number one. <clears throat> I think number two is um, some expression of empathy. Like I am horrified that this occurred or yeah. Uh, maybe I'm thinking back to you and your buddy or whoever it was that said the thing that hurt you, you go. Yeah. And it makes sense, man. If, if somebody said that to me, I would be hurt too. You know, if I, if I watched somebody else do what I just did, I would be mortified, like some expression of empathy around that. I get it. So I guess number one would be, I did it. And number two would be, I get it. And I think if there's a third thing there, there has to be this commitment to change, right? A commitment to altering the relationship or altering the behavior or altering the landscape. Um, which of course is really easy to say and harder to do, but I think it ought to be included. We ought to say, I, you know what? I don't want to be that person in your life. It makes you feel yucky or I don't, I, you know, um, some, some, uh, offer of repentance maybe would be a good way to put it. And I do, I do think that there's an art 
to the apology. I think there's also an art, Leo, to receiving an apology. Um, and I think uh, the first the, the first part of that is saying, hey, thank you. Thank you for offering to repair. Thank you for, I know that was a big deal. I know that it means a lot. It means a lot to me that you would um, meet me here in this space. Like that can be enough, right? Now, I think what comes next is one of two things. One might be, I forgive you. It's all good. Water under the bridge. We got this. Like I'm, I'm ride or die. Let's go. We, we can cover this. But the second one, if you didn't get what you needed, is to say, I think I still need this part. There's another part of it that I think would be helpful for me to hear from you. Um, you know, and maybe, maybe, you know, maybe Chris Rock goes, you know what? I'm sorry too for making this this uh, joke, and I'm willing to offer that apology. But I think we both owe an apology to, you know, Jessica Chastain or whatever, whatever to the economy or to. I don't know what it is. I, I'm not speculating about that, but I think if you get an apology, start with gratitude. And if you still need something more, ask for that as a functional adult, you know? You know, that you brought up an interesting point of a joint apology, right? Like that they, maybe they both could make a, uh, I mean, I know they made separate apologies, but I don't know if you were, uh, you briefly mentioned it and I kind of interpret it as, maybe they both made an apology together. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what you were saying. I don't, I don't know if I was trying to prescribe that as much as just speculate okay. about what does it take for these two guys who have dominated the news cycle for 24 hours, 48 hours now, the entertainment news cycle to, to make some amends, you know? Um, I think that that's a worthy question. And there's a version of the whole thing in which Chris Rock is not culpable, right? I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole point of view, I think, that you could take on that. But, you know, still, he has an opportunity to do something remarkable. And I, I suspect he'll do it. I mean, for all accounts, Chris is a good guy, and so is Will, you know? So I think they'll find a way to message the right thing, but we'll see, we'll see right? So to, to circle all the way back to the beginning, uh, when you talked about, you know, the, this idea that we have a parent, an adult, and a child, mm -hmm. um, I would imagine there's a place for all three of those. Absolutely. And yeah. can you yeah. talk to us about how they service, uh, what the challenges might be with having the three of those? And, uh, you know, what are best? Yeah, I mean, the child is just the emotional, responsive, reactive part of all of us you know, and that's, we want that guy to show up from time to time. He really likes having sex and going on roller coasters and watching movies and crying. Like that's, that's allowed. Why not? You know, um, sometimes though he, he or she, I guess in my case, it's a, he, he doesn't know what to do with shame or embarrassment or anger because his, he's not operating out of his best brain, you know? The parent is the corrective directive version, right? The parent is the one who's in charge, who has opinions, who needs to make sure that he's directing traffic um, and, you know, uh, trying to kind of um, certainly manage the child. But sometimes it's complicated when a parent tries to manage another, like an adult, right? That's where the transaction gets broken. Um, and then the adult is the one who's sort of the most rational of us, the one who has access to the pause the one who's able to sort of discern the best choice to make here. It's really hard to do when you're flooded, as you noted earlier on. Um, but the functional adult is the one who ideally is in charge of the um, uh, sort of in charge of the, the bus. Terry Reel, who's a couples therapist that I really love and admire, he talks, he has a really keen metaphor on this where he talks about, you know, the functional adult's responsibility is to walk onto the bus and notice that there's a child driving and say to that child, Hey buddy, um, glad you're here. I got you, but you you belong back there. You need to go sit down, put your seatbelt on. I'm going to drive this bus because we would never let the child drive the bus, right? Like it's just part of the part of common sense. So when you're in these situations that have high circumstances, high consequences, or high visibility, you know, or high relational impact, really important to try and bring your functional adult to the front. What does Will Smith say to Chris Rock? to let him know that what he said wasn't okay. You know, say, say we absent have the, the situation. Slap. Absent, yeah, absent the slap. 
So he does he does the thing. He turns to Jada. Yes, he has a conversation with Jada. And now we're, we're after the award show. Uh, it, does he approach him at the awards party or does he wait till the next day? Well, that does he point, email him? At that point, you have to remember he's an Oscar winner who hasn't also tainted his his Oscar with this act of violence, right? So I think at that point he can say, hey, great night, you know, whatever. Chris Rock's going to say congratulations on your win. And he's going to say, I got this thing that's been bugging me. Um, and it's been bugging me for a couple of reasons. And one is I, I was bugged by the joke in part because I laughed at it without really thinking about what it was. Second, like Jada really hurt. Like that's like, she's been struggling with alopecia for a while, you know? Um, and I just wonder if there's not a way that we can make that better or okay. Like, do you think you could talk to Jada or do you think we could maybe raise some money for alopecia? I don't know. But there is something that says, I want to validate, Chris, that you were just doing your job. And again, here's the thing. I don't know anything at all about the actual nuances of their relationship behind the scenes. But I'm just thinking about two people who fundamentally respect each other can find their way into the same space and acknowledge that this. The other thing is, ultimately, it just wasn't that big of a deal. Will Smith doesn't stand up and walk across the stage. Nobody cares about this. Not even Jada Smith, Jada Pinkett, I think. You know, she would have gone home, whined about the joke that Chris Rock made. They would have said, yeah, that guy's an asshole. And then they would have toasted their, you know, poured champagne and in, into their Oscar trophies, butt or something. I don't know. What, I don't know how you do that, but you know, they would, it would have been a non-event, you know? Yeah. I've had, I imagine had so. I, you know, I've had, had a similar situation happen where uh, I was on a date and a buddy said something that really bothered me. And I verbally reacted and, you know, then I realized that he didn't realize the impact of what he said. And in my head, I was like, you know, full well, uh, what you did and why you did it and, and the impact it would have. And looking back, I realized I, I truly could have pulled him to the side and said, Hey, you know what you said and blah, blah. And what I love in your apology or what, not the apology, but in the, the Will Smith talking to Chris Rock, you know, uh, behind the scenes was you included we. Like, how can we versus mm -hmm. putting the onus on him to make the amends or him to figure it out? Like, you blah, blah, blah. You Can you talk to us? Like, why, do you, why did you use we? Why does it sound more collaborative? Well, I mean, it's that in that case, I was just sort of imagining what does makeup sex look, look like for these guys? like where they create something new, they create something that feels like, but the other thing is, I think it, I think people like a story of reconciliation. That's, I mean, we like that story. It's a great, it's a, it's a great model for, you know, what I think the world ought to be like, right. It's reaching across the aisle. It's coming, it's coming together. It's stuff that we haven't seen a lot of in the last couple of years. So for me, it's like, what would it mean for us to actually find a solution that works for us both? Um, I think that just ought to be the posture that we enter, that we engage difference with. Like what's, what's going to work for us both here. What? And in this case, I think what's going to work for us both here that actually draws attention to others. Tell me more about that. You meaning in terms of uh, like, if we're talking about Will and, Will and Chris, about like what can work in turn, and then that also highlights the other. Uh, I mean, again, I just have a actresses. lot of contempt for men who abuse power, and so in this case, these two men have again dominated the news cycle. And would it, would would it be cool if they pointed to other, pointed to something else, and say, "Hey, don't look over here. Look over there. This is even this isn't even about us. This is about you know trying to help." I don't know, maybe for the first time in my mind, the first time ever, it popped into my mind that what about these kids with alopecia who are watching the Oscars? Like, were they offended? Do they need a symbol of hope or whatever? You know, Jada Smith today, I think she, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith, she, she posted something today about how she's um, here for healing. Like she's all about healing. I'm like, let's do that. That, that necessarily requires that we point to the other. You know, what's fascinating about that is I am in, um, a 12-step program 
for my sugar addiction, and I've shared that with others. And one of the things they talk about is, you know, when you're in pain or when you're hurting or you're, you're kind of flooded, it's, it's to do for other people, to be of service. Yeah. And so it sounds like that's part of what you're saying here of like, listen, while we have all this attention on us, we can use this to shine a light on bigger causes, bigger issues, uh, or, you know, people doing really cool and wonderful things. So they inst- we can go from abusing power to using our power to uh, propel others forward. Yeah. And again, I, I, as a, as a middle-class white Christian cis guy in America right now, I feel like I have a kind of a job to sort of back off some of this, like a little bit and try and, and try and get, get my energy behind and specific cases, my two teenage daughters and my wife. Um, but yeah, I think that would, well, that'd be great if, if more of us got out of the way and used the privilege that we did have to make it an easier road for others. Zach, this was uh, incredible. And is there anything else uh, that you feel like we need to cover on this topic in terms of managing emotions, how to repair, um, you know, how to turn towards each other yeah. in, in conflict <clears throat> versus feeling like we have to handle things independently? Uh, is, there, is there anything that we... I mean, I guess for me, it's... Uh... Unless you are physically in danger, being attacked by a bear, right? There's always, it's always good to pause first, always. Like there's no, it costs you nothing to wait and measure your response and, and call on that adult, right? Um, and I think, again, you know, wisdom is learning how to create that pause and to make, make the right choice about what's to do. And turning towards your partner is a, rarely a mistake. You know, offering repairs, rarely mistake. By the way, there's always, always, always something you can apologize for. Always. It's not binary, right? Um, it, 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 really good example, Chris. Uh, maybe, maybe Will Smith was the lone offender, but Chris Rock could apologize for telling a joke that was uh, like that was out of bounds. And now the two of us are in a relationship where the two of us are taking responsibility for the way we behaved. Um, and the way that we, you know, what are we going to do about it? That's, I think, uh, what the beauty of even being in a, like a committed relationship, which is my jam 40 hours a week, but, um, is what, what can we do to make this thing better for us and for those that we love and care about often our kids, but it's also our community or whoever billion people might be watching on TV. (laughs) Are are there, are there jokes, uh, jokes, (laughs) are there books that you would recommend for people uh, to one, learn how to turn towards each other, uh, two, to learn how to uh, express or even become aware, because I think a, a large part of it is we have these emotions, these feelings uh, that, that come up and we're not quite sure what they are to, to even label it. Like I was aware that I was hurt, but that's mm-hmm. only because I understood the vocabulary and the, and the um, but uh, there's so many people who aren't even aware of when they're hurt. Um, so are yeah. there books that would help us or, you know, in terms of apology or, or, or... I'll tell you about three books. Um, let me look one of them up right now. Hold on. And how long have you been married, Zach? Uh, we do, we do 25 this summer. Oh, what a quarter of a century. I know. Congratulations, right? buddy. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> okay, here's three books. Number one, this is my all-time favorite recommendation for couples uh, who are trying to make sense of or to find new language around their relationship. It's a book called The Course of Love. It's by Alain de Botton, who is a philosopher. The book itself is a novel about a couple that's kind of making their way through their life, but he 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 writes it in two fonts. He writes it in regular font and he writes it in italic font. And the italic font is all the philosophy of relationship connected to the narrative that he just gave us in the regular font. It's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant book. It's easily the best relationship book out there for people. It's not a to-do book. That would be the second book. The second book is called We've Had This Fight Before. It's by a woman named Claudia Grouf-Browns and it's, um, 
it's a really fantastic book written for people with maybe with ADHD, lots of cartoons and bullet points and whatever else. But um, it's based on the premise that couples don't have 300 fights. They have three fights. They have the same three fights over and over and over again. And there are specific skills for people who are in that sort of thing to help them navigate those three fights. And the fourth one is a book that I have, a third one is a book I have not read, but somebody just told me about, and it's an answer, direct answer to your question, but it's Brene Brown's new book. It's called Atlas of the Heart. Um, and it's basically, uh, as I understand it, it's a basically an emotional thesaurus, or I guess an atlas of words and language that can uh, help people who maybe aren't as emotionally intelligent or articulate or aware collect some, some words for their feelings like hurt and you know, people who are sad, maybe they're sad because they're depressed or nostalgic or gloomy or, you know, those are all different kinds of sad and it helps to learn those. Um, <clears throat> so if you're looking for something to put on your shelf, uh, those three are all uh, good books. And then I don't mind plugging my own. I wrote a book called um, The Marriage Therapy Journal, which is also uh, one that you can kind of write in and work on, but it's it's designed as a book that mirrors my client work with people. And so people who come in and, and want to just kind of walk a, a path toward relationship maturity, there's a lot in there. Obviously I feel really good about because I wrote it. So, <laughs> uh, that's that, so hopefully one of the, one or more of those resources will be of help to you. I love it, man. And you know what I love about the first option course of love is that it's a novel and, uh, you know, I'm, such a firm believer that we learn so much more about the human condition from novels and and but i also yeah. love the idea of mixing it up yep. so that as you're reading a novel you have context from the more instructional self-help yeah but i feel like people to go too deep into self-help and they never yep. come back to the novels so that they don't get a practice a good blend. and i have i've marked up almost every page i've written or underlined <laughs> or annotated something on nearly every page of that book so I can't recommend it enough. Uh, is there anything else that you want to share, Zach? No, I'm good, man. You should just let me know when you're in Seattle. We'll come out and watch you. We'll laugh a little bit. And um, How can people find you? I know you're probably busy, swamp. I don't even know if you have room um, in your schedule right now. I'm easy to find. My first and last name, ZachBertle.com, is where my private practice is, and uh, people can interact with me there. I also have a weekly podcast that comes out on Tuesdays. It's called Marriage Therapy Radio, which I do with my partner, Laura, not my not my marriage partner, my, my teaching partner, Laura, uh, my wife is Rebecca. We have 25 years this summer, but um, yeah, those two are the kind of the easiest place to find me. You can find the podcast anywhere podcasts are sold. We also exist at marriagetherapyradio.com. Love it. And last question I ask of all my guests, because I always imagine there's one person listening in who may be on the precipice of wanting to end their life. Before you kill yourself, what would you say to them, Zach Brittle? Uh, well, you asked me this question once before and I have the same answer, but maybe I'll nuance it a little bit. Um, what I would say is don't, um, but because that's sometimes not helpful, I would say, put the pause in there. The one that we've been talking about all day, like put that pause in there and call on your functional adult. And maybe that person needs to make a phone call or journal or just take a nap or eat a sandwich. Like the, the those things happen so impulsively that we need to call on our adult to help us make a wiser decision. I love that. You know what? I, I want to check out that book on a parent child adult thing, because I have so many questions about that as we're wrapping up. Yeah, and, that's called transactional analysis. So okay. you go, you'll Google that and find any book that you want on it. Yeah. Well, Zach, we're going to have you back on, man. This was fun. And, uh, and I appreciate you taking the time out and thank you so much listeners for tuning in. Remember, yeah, this course. podcast is not a substitute for you going to get help. Call you calling the 1 800 S U I C I D E or 1 800 273 Talks. Or if you're in the national in Spain or Sri Lanka or the Ukraine or Mexico or Portugal, wherever you are in the world, there are international phone numbers there for you. You can talk, you can chat, you can text, you can go to thrivewithleo.com for one on one coaching with yours truly. Let's get to tomorrow together. Thank you so much, Zach. You got it, man.